All right, that looks good. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, Manuel, so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm very excited to be part of this seminar series and to present my work examining how light influences sleep and circadian rhythms in childhood. Young children are frequently exposed to artificial light at night. In fact, a 2020 report by Common Sense Media found that almost half of children under age eight use screen media in the hour before bedtime. And we know that children's media use is associated with various negative health outcomes or sleep outcomes, such as later bedtime, longer sleep onset latency, and shorter total sleep duration. Evening sleep problems are common during the preschool years, with approximately 30% of young children experiencing short sleep and or behavioral sleep disturbances, which includes bedtime resistance, difficulty falling asleep, and night awakenings. These problems often persist throughout the school-aged years and are associated with both concurrent and future attentional, emotional, and behavioral problems, as well as an increased risk of obesity. And sleep timing is regulated in part by the timing of the circadian clock, which itself is primarily determined by light exposure. Even low levels of light can affect sleep, circadian timing, and alertness. So in a world of increasing exposure to artificial light and screen-based media devices, my research aims to understand the role of light in young children's circadian rhythms and sleep health. Light influences sleep and circadian timing through stimulation of the eye's intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGC. And these are ocular photoreceptors that are maximally sensitive to blue light at about 480 nanometers, and they express the photopigment melanopsin. When stimulated, the signal is transmitted from the IPRGC via the retinal hypothalamic tract to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master circadian clock. The SEN then modulates the pineal glands production of the sleep-promoting hormone melatonin. And exposure to the light at night can suppress the production of melatonin and delay circadian timing. Signals from the IPRGC also contribute to the pupillary light reflex, or PLR, which controls the diameter of the pupil in response to a light stimulus via the olivary pretectal nucleus. And today I'll actually be presenting data that we've collected on both of these outcomes. First, on the impact of evening light on melatonin production in preschool age children, and then on the PLR in response to red and blue light in school age children and adolescents. So since I'll be talking about the non-visual system in young children, I wanted to first give some background information about the early development of the mammalian IPRGC. So in mice, the IPRGC are present and light sensitive from birth. So this top figure depicts the proportion of ganglion cells that are light sensitive with a much higher proportion observed in newborn mice than those just a few days older. Similarly, in the bottom figure, the density of melanopsin expressing cells is very high in the neonate animal and then rapidly decreases. Research is still pretty scarce on the development of the human IPRGC, but what we do know suggests that similar to rodents, the system emerges early in an individual's development. The photopigment melanopsin has been observed in human eye tissue as early as eight weeks post conception. And we can also look at the development of the pupillary light reflex as an indicator of IPRGC functionality. So this figure on the right depicts the number of premature babies at each week of gestational age who either display a pupillary light reflex, and those are the ones in the shaded bars, or those who don't, which are the blank bars. And as you can see, the PLR emerges in preterm infants between 30 and 35 weeks gestational age, which again, suggesting the human IPRGC are sensitive to light input by full-term birth. Lastly, several studies have examined the effects of cycled lighting, meaning lights on during the daytime and lights either very dim or off during the nighttime on preterm infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. 
And data from these clinical studies indicate that exposing premature infants to a light dark cycle rather than a constant light environment is associated with distinct patterns of rest and activity that appear one week after discharge, a better growth rate and a shorter hospital stay. So taken together, these studies provide evidence of light detection and entrainment early in human development and highlight the importance of environmental signals to the development of the clock and sleep. I'm next gonna review some data examining the impacts of light intensity on the human circadian system. Intensity can be measured in a variety of units, but in the work I'll be discussing, it is presented primarily in terms of illuminance, the unit of which is lux. So for anyone not familiar with this unit, one lux is defined as the brightness of one candle one meter away from the eye. So moonlight is only about 0.1 lux and sunrise sunset is very bright at 10,000 lux. But important values to keep in mind for the rest of my talk are that typical room lighting is usually somewhere between 100 to 300 lux and an iPad screen at full brightness one foot away is about 100 lux. So jumping ahead from infancy, we know that an individual's circadian sensitivity to light changes across the lifespan. And data from several studies suggests that children are more sensitive to light exposure than adults. So in this study, nine-year-old children showed almost twice as much melatonin suppression following an evening bright light exposure compared with their parents. <clears throat> Our research focuses on sensitivity to light in preschool age children, of which we still know very little. And previous work from our lab demonstrated that the evening lighting environment does play a significant role in the timing of the circadian clock in this age group. 21 children followed a stable sleep schedule and wore a pendant light meter for four days, then completed a dim light melatonin onset assessment. And light exposure in the two hours before bedtime averaged about 700 lux across all of the children. When controlling for bedtime, children exposed to more evening light had later melatonin onsets. And in a hierarchical linear regression model, evening light exposure accounted for 13% of the variance in the timing of DILMO. Building on those initial findings, our lab examined preschool-age children's melatonin suppression response to a bright light stimulus of 1,000 lux in the hour before habitual bedtime. And in this figure, the closed circles represent salivary melatonin levels on a baseline night measured under dim light conditions, and the open circles represent melatonin levels the following night during which they received the light stimulus as highlighted in the figure in yellow. An acute suppression of melatonin was calculated by examining the ratio of the area under the curve during the light stimulus compared with the same clock times on the previous evening. And during the light exposure, children exhibited robust melatonin suppression of about 88% compared with the baseline night with melatonin levels remaining attenuated even 50 minutes after light offset. In adults, we know that even low levels of light can affect circadian rhythms. Furthermore, as can be seen in these figures, light exposure in the evening both suppresses melatonin and delays circadian timing in a dose-dependent manner with intensity. So the brighter the light exposure, the greater the circadian response. In these data, following a six and a half hour nighttime light exposure, 50% of the maximal phase shifting response was observed after exposure to light of about 100 lux, which is well within the range of typical indoor room light. And a more recent paper has demonstrated that the adult circadian system may be even more sensitive to light than previously thought. Participants were exposed to a range of light levels between 10 to 2000 lux for five hours in the evening. And across the entire group, 50% melatonin suppression occurred at only about 25 lux. Additionally, they found a lot of individual differences among participants, with the 50% response ranging from only 6 lux in one participant up to 350 lux in another.
Okay, that sounds like a internet connection problem. Um, let's see if she can join again. Oh, sorry about that. My internet went out. <laughs> Manuel, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, let me make you co-host again. And then I think you can turn your video on again. I have no idea why that happened. We had a, a speaker last, last semester who dropped out of the call and didn't know she did. And that was, <laughs> probably, um, she was giving a talk in front of a no audience. So I was worried that happened. <laughs> okay, cool. I think I caught it. So is this where I was? Hopefully yeah, we saw this. This is the last slide you were on. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Well, that's a good spot to transition in here. So since our lab studies sleep and development in young children, Parents frequently ask us how much light before bed is too much light for their child's sleep. But unlike we have in adults, there's currently no research examining the sensitivity of young children to different intensities of light in order to inform those recommendations. And so a big focus of our research in the last few years has been to establish illuminance response curves to evening light in young children. And to do this, we examined the impact of exposure to different intensities of light one hour prior to bedtime on melatonin levels and circadian timing in preschool age children. And our a priori hypothesis was that light before bed would suppress melatonin and induce phase delay in a nonlinear intensity dependent manner. We collected data from 33 children ages three and four years all participants went through a rigorous screening process to ensure that we only enrolled healthy children with no sleep circadian or ophthalmological disorders. Our main measure was salivary melatonin, and we collected saliva by having the child chew on a braided cotton roll for about two minutes, as you can see in this picture, until the cotton was saturated, and it was then placed in a tube and centrifuge. So if you're a parent or if you've spent time with young children, you can probably imagine that a three-year-old being told by a person they don't know to chew on this cotton stick is not going to go over very well. So before the study protocol, we conducted training visits with the children to introduce them to the saliva collection technique and familiarize them with the researchers who we call the sleep fairies. And we utilize similar child-friendly terms throughout the assessments to help the researchers and the protocol feel more playful and approachable for children. This figure depicts the study protocol, which lasted for a total of 10 days. For the first seven days, parents were asked to keep their child on a strict sleep-wake schedule. Additionally, the child wore an actigraph and pendant light meter throughout the study, and the parent completed a daily sleep diary. And then the final three days of the study consisted of a dim light assessment, which we call cave days with the children. 
As you can imagine, it would be very difficult to get preschoolers and their parents to live in a sleep lab for three days. So we conducted all of our research protocols in participants' homes where we recreated well-controlled laboratory-like conditions. <clears throat> so here's an example of our team in the process of converting a home into a dim light environment. As you can see, we first covered all the windows in the home with black tarp. We then ensured that all light levels throughout the home were below 10 lux at the child angle of gaze. And this is accomplished through covering, dimming, or redirecting home light fixtures or adding in dim lamps when needed. And throughout the duration of the dim light assessments, children were exposed to an average of approximately 1.5 lux as measured from their wrist. But setting up the dim light environment involves more than just addressing light fixtures. Think about your home and all the appliances and electronic gadgets that emit light, like refrigerators, water dispensers, clothes dryers, flashlights, etc. And now think about a children's house, uh, their toys, their stuffed animals, their alarm clocks light up, they have shoes that light up, their toothbrushes light up. There are so, so many objects in a child's home with lights. And when we set up a home for an assessment, we work closely with the parents and the child themselves to identify any object in the home that might light up. And then we either disable it or ensure that it's out of the child's reach for the duration of the protocol. So just one second of exposure to a light source that we miss can immediately end an assessment. But thankfully, I'm proud to say that it's quite rare that that happens. And once the assessment starts, the child remains in the home, in the dim light at all times through the end of the protocol. During these cave days, from the time the child wakes up until they go to bed, a team of researchers is with them at all times, ensuring that the dim light environment is maintained and that there are no accidental exposures to any light source over 10 lux. So on day eight, children entered the dim light environment four hours, four and a half hours before their scheduled bedtime. We then obtained a baseline measure of their dim light melatonin onset, or DELMO. We collected saliva samples in 20 to 30 minute intervals throughout the evening, and that's indicated by the black dots in the figure, until one hour past their habitual bedtime. And on the ninth evening, the children experienced a one hour light exposure in the hour before their habitual bedtime. As you can see here, we played games with them at a dimmable LED light table, in order to keep their gaze focused down continually on the light source. So we color with them on overhead transparencies or we play with them with translucent blocks. And each child was randomly assigned to one light intensity between 5, lux, five and 5,000 lux. And the light source has a CCT of 5,000 Kelvin. Finally, on the 10th evening, we measured their DILMO a second time taking samples until two and a half hours past bedtime in order to capture any patient. And we calculated acute melatonin suppression during the light exposure, as I described before. And phase shift was calculated by subtracting the time of the child's baseline DELMO from their final DELMO. So here is a figure depicting group, averages, group average melatonin levels on day eight which was the baseline night and is represented by the closed circles and day nine, which was the light exposure night and is the open circles. And melatonin levels on day nine were significantly lower 10, 30 and 50 minutes after the light turned on, as well as 20 and 50 minutes after the end of the light exposure as compared with the same clock time on day eight. But did melatonin suppression differ by light intensity? A reminder of what the melatonin suppression response curve looks like in adults across light intensities. So there's very little melatonin suppression to low levels of light, then a gradual increase with greater illuminance, and eventually a saturation of the response from exposure to bright light. So these data are not directly comparable to ours due to differences in the length and the timing of the light exposure, but we predicted that we would observe a similar general shape. But instead, here's what we observed. So in this figure depicting percent melatonin suppression across each experimental light intensity, we see that children had a very high level of melatonin suppression in response to light across the full range of intensities. Melatonin suppression ranged from 69 to 
with an average suppression of 86% and no clear relationship with light intensity was observed. We were unable to calculate the intensity of the half maximal suppression response because the minimum suppression was well over 50%. However, <clears throat> when we break the light intensities into quartiles, we now observe that children exposed to the lowest quartile of light intensities had significantly less melatonin suppression than those assigned to each of the three higher quartiles. But keep in mind, the average melatonin suppression in that lowest quartile is still 77%. So if we scale the figure now with the y-axis at zero, you can still really see again that children's acute melatonin response was highly sensitive even to those low light intensities. Moving on to phase shift, this figure depicts group averages of melatonin levels on days eight and 10. Melatonin levels on the final night were significantly lower than the same clock time on the baseline night at 50, 30, and 10 minutes before habitual bedtime, as well as 20 minutes and 50 minutes after children's typical bedtimes. And on average, Dilma was delayed by 56 minutes on day 10 compared to day eight. And here's the observed phase delay in minutes across the experimental light intensities for each individual child. The phase shift ranged from an eight minute phase advance to a 123 minute phase delay. And again, contrary to our hypothesis, we did not observe any clear relationship between light intensity and the magnitude of the phase delay. Rather, we see robust phase delays across the full range of intensities, even at lower illuminances. With children exposed to only five and 10 lux, having an average delay of 45 minutes. In this figure, we have individual melatonin curves for six children. So the orange lines represent the baseline night and the blue line represents melatonin on the final night of the assessment. The dotted line at four picograms per milliliter is at the threshold for calculating DILMO. So when we're looking at phase shift, it's the difference in the time at which the orange and the blue lines cross that dotted line. The top two panels depict children who received low intensities of light at close circadian times. Then the middle panels are those receiving a medium intensity of light and the bottom panels at a high intensity. In each pair, despite the similarities in the circadian timing and the intensity of the light exposure, we observe large inter-individual differences with the phase delay in each pair differing by 30 to 40 minutes. And this echoes the large inter-individual differences in photosensitivity observed in adults. So altogether, the findings from the study demonstrated that young children's melatonin production and circadian timing may be highly sensitive to light exposure in the hour before bedtime. And an important implication of these findings comes from the fact that young children generally do not choose their own bedtimes. Although adults typically self-select bedtimes about two hours after melatonin onset on average, parent selected bedtimes occur an average of only 48 minutes after melatonin onset in toddlers and preschoolers. And in about 10 to 20% of the data that our lab has collected on circadian rhythms in preschoolers, parent selected bedtime actually occurs before melatonin onset. So in this double plotted figure of average sleep timing in toddlers, the triangles denote DOMO time and the black horizontal bar represents their time in bed. So the start of the black bar would be their bedtime. And for these children, DOMO doesn't occur until after their lights out time. So with such a small phase angle of entrainment between DOMO and bedtime, a light-induced phase delay of the magnitude observed in our data, even in response to a dimmer light exposure, pushed DOMO very close to or even after parent-selected bedtime for many young children. So back to this figure, if DOMO was delayed by 56 minutes, which was the average shift that we observed across all the light intensities, now all of these children are also being put to bed before their melatonin onset. Moreover, previous work from our lab demonstrated that as parent-selected bedtime gets closer to children's melatonin onset, 
children take longer to fall asleep and have increased bedtime resistance. So if children's dilemmas are being pushed later by evening artificial light exposure, a mismatch between their bedtime and circadian timing could be contributing to that high prevalence of late sleep timing and behavioral sleep problems that are commonly observed at this age. But why are young children so sensitive to evening light exposure? One possible reason is because of developmental changes in anatomical features of the eye. Specifically, children have both larger pupils and clearer lenses than adults, allowing more light into the eye to stimulate their retinal ganglion cells. As humans age, the ocular lens becomes more yellow, making it more difficult for blue light in particular to get through. So on the left, you can see images of six human donor lenses at different ages, becoming progressively more opaque. And the figure on the right depicts lens transmittance for different wavelengths of light for school-age children in red and their parents in blue. And at 480 nanometers, which again, it's that peak sensitivity of the IPRGC, transmission through the lens was 8.6% higher in children than in adults. Regarding pupil size, in this figure, pupil diameter is compared between school-age children and their parents under dim and bright light. And under both conditions, children had significantly larger pupils than their parents. In fact, pupil diameter increases across development, peaking in adolescence, and then slowly decreases again throughout adulthood. In adults, individual differences in pupil size are associated with melatonin suppression by light. So in this study of 23 adult males, individuals with larger pupil area under both dim and bright light also exhibited greater melatonin suppression in response to a two hour bright light exposure. Other work has demonstrated that light induced melatonin suppression also increases when pupils are pharmacologically dilated. So whether an individual has naturally larger pupils or they are artificially dilated, a larger pupil is associated with a greater circadian response to light in adults. Therefore, children's larger pupils may make them more susceptible to the circadian effects of evening light exposure as we observed in our findings. Speaking of pupils brings me to the second project that I wanna talk about today on the sensitivity of the pupillary light reflex to the wavelength of evening light in children and adolescents. So as a reminder, the IPRGC greatly contribute to pupil constriction in response to light. In fact, signals from the IPRGC were found to contribute to the pupillary pathway by a factor of three times more than the long and medium cone signals. In particular, the sustained pupillary response is a marker of the strength of IPRGC activation. And finally, the pupillary response to blue monochromatic light has been associated with circadian disruption, assessed from skin temperature, motor activity, and light exposure. As you might imagine, the 10-day protocol that we use in our lab to assess circadian rhythms in young children which includes setting up the dim light environment every time in a family's home and keeping the child engaged across three days is challenging and time consuming. So because the PLR is increasingly being recognized as a marker of IPRGC activation and potentially components of the circadian system, it represents a quicker and easier method of examining the non-visual response to light in developmental populations. So a little background on what we know about the PLR throughout childhood. Um, this study examined the PLR in response to blue and red light at two different intensities in premature infants at 38 weeks gestational age. And in all 23 premature infants they tested, red light did not induce pupil constrictions at either intensity. But the pupil reflex was elicited by the blue light with a stronger response to the brighter intensity suggesting that the early PLR is predominantly mediated by the IPRGC. And this and other prior work have demonstrated that a robust pupil response to light is present in children with stronger responses to blue compared to red light observed across development. 
However, the IPRGC-driven pupil response is influenced by both the circadian timing of the assessment, as well as the light history of the subject, which have not been very well controlled for in the literature, and leaving a gap in our understanding of the pupillary response to light in children. So this present study extends these initial findings in children by assessing the PLR in response to evening light of different wavelengths using a protocol that we designed to control for some of those confounding factors and furthermore examine whether age-related differences are present in the magnitude and the duration of the PLR by comparing between two developmental stages. So we had 40 healthy, good sleeping participants aged eight and nine or 15 and 16 years complete a six day within subjects protocol. Participants first maintained a stable sleep schedule for five days, which was verified through actigraphy and a daily sleep diary. Participants were instructed to avoid any light exposure between bedtime and wake time to ensure a consistent light dark timing. And on the sixth and final day of the protocol, participants remained indoors throughout the day while wearing a pair of dark glasses, which blocked 80 to 90% of melanopic lux, which is light most likely to stimulate the IPRGC. And these procedures were used to limit bright light exposure and reduce individual variability in light history. Finally, that evening, they came into our lab for a pupillary assessment. They first spent one hour adapting to a dimly lit room of below one lux. Then we started the assessment one hour before each participant's habitual bedtime in order to anchor the assessment within a consistent circadian window. And you can see the experimental setup in the image on the right. We have a child wearing the eye tracking glasses with his face in a chin rest in order to maintain a consistent distance from the light source. We then measured their pupil diameter during a 30 second baseline, a 10 second light exposure to either red or blue light and a 40 second recovery. Following a seven minute dim light readaptation, the procedure was repeated for the other lighting condition, the order of which was counterbalanced across participants. So here you can see an image of each light source that we used and a figure depicting the spectrum of the two light stimuli here in units of photon flux. And we aimed for near monochromatic light with the blue light having a peak wavelength of 459 nanometers and melanopic EDI of 70 lux and the red light peaking at 627 nanometers with a melanopic EDI of 0.1 lux. And melanopic EDI is melanopic equivalent daylight illuminance and it's a unit describing the magnitude of the response of the IPRGC. So given that the IPRGC are maximally sensitive to short wavelength light, it's not surprising that the blue light stimulus has a much higher melanopic EDI than the red light. The two light conditions were presented to participants matched at the same photon density. So this means that each participant's eyes received the same number of photons from each light source. So in this figure on the left, you can see the timing of the experimental protocol with time since light onset on the x-axis and pupil constriction on the y-axis. And this graph has been normalized to have baseline pupil be at 0% constriction. So you can see for the first 30 seconds in the dim light, there's a very stable baseline pupil size. Then at time zero, the light turns on, the pupil rapidly constricts. At time 10, the light turns back off and the pupil begins to redilate, approaching back towards the baseline pupil size. We first examined phasic pupil constriction, which is indicated by the red diamond in the figure, and that's the magnitude of pupil constriction 500 milliseconds after light onset as a percentage away from the baseline pupil diameter. And this illustrates the strength of that initial pupillary response to light. And in the figure on the right, we have percent phasic constriction broken down by light color and age group. Blue light elicited a marginally larger response than red light across both age groups. We also observed significantly greater initial constriction in children compared to adolescents by about 4.3% across both light conditions. We next analyzed the maximum pupil constriction, which is defined as the smallest the pupil gets during the light exposure, expressed again as a percentage away from the baseline. And you can see that pupil constriction is about two to 3% greater in response to blue compared to red light for both age groups. 
Additionally, maximum constriction was about four and a half percent greater in children than in adolescents across both light conditions. And finally, we have the sustained slope, which is the best fit slope of pupil constriction between three to 10 seconds after light onset. And it describes the continued response during the light stimulus and is a good marker for the contribution of melanopsin to the response. And as you can see, the slope was significantly smaller in response to blue compared to red light across both age groups. So this means that the pupil redilated more slowly during the blue light exposure than during the red. And then additionally, during exposure to blue light, the slope was significantly larger for children than for adolescents, indicating a less sustained response. So here we have averages for all participants adjusted to baseline pupil diameter with solid lines for children and dotted lines for adolescents. So to sum up, in this well-controlled laboratory study, we observed a greater and more sustained pupillary response to blue compared to red light presented in the hour before bedtime for both age groups. And you can see that pretty clearly in the average figure, especially the difference in the sustained slope during the light exposure with the red lines beginning to redilate during the light exposure a lot faster than the blue. Additionally, we observed that children had a greater initial and maximal response across both light colors than adolescents, as well as a less sustained response to blue light than adolescents. Our PLR data suggests that light sensitivity as measured by the amplitude of the pupillary response is reduced in adolescents compared to children. And this also echoes findings by Stephanie Crowley and Mary Karskadden of a reduced circadian response to light in later adolescents. Pre-pubertal adolescents demonstrated significantly more melatonin suppression to evening light exposure at 15, 150, and 500 lux than post-pubertal adolescents. So together, these data point to a reduction in light sensitivity across development. Our PLR data are also highly consistent with previous findings from mice, suggesting that maturation of the pupillary light reflex continues until adulthood. In this study, the PLR in response to red and blue light was compared in one-month-old mice to post-pubertal two-month-old mice and adult four-month-old mice. And the one-month-old mice exhibited greater maximal constriction to both light stimuli, as well as a smaller sustained response to blue light, which very much mirrors what we observed between children and adolescents, suggesting a similar continued development of the PLR might be occurring during youth in humans. One thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately and gets a little confusing is trying to reconcile the data on pupil size and light sensitivity on the one hand and development and light sensitivity on the other. First, a reminder that in adults, larger pupils are associated with a greater circadian response to light. And we also know that pupil size increases during childhood and peaks in late adolescence at around 15 or 16 years. But older post-pubertal adolescents who we would presume to have larger pupils display less melatonin suppression to light than younger pre-pubertal adolescents. And in the PLR study I just reviewed on mice, the one-month-old mice did in fact have a smaller reported baseline pupil diameter compared to both groups of older mice. Yet, despite having smaller pupils, the younger mice had a stronger response. So together, this seems to suggest that there is more underlying children being highly sensitive to evening light than simply having larger pupils and that the maturation of the non-visual system and subsequent reduction in photosensitivity across development is also occurring somewhere else more downstream. Um, if anyone has ideas or a better understanding of the animal literature on this topic, please share. I'd love to discuss and brainstorm how to parse this apart better. But to sum everything up, First, our findings in preschoolers indicated that young children are highly sensitive to light exposure in the hour before bedtime and suggest that the lighting environment may play a crucial role in the development and maintenance of behavioral sleep problems through impacts on the circadian timing system. And this points to evening light exposure as a modifiable factor in children's environments that could improve their sleep. 
Additionally, our PLR data with school-age children and adolescents suggest that sensitivity to light may reduce across development. And the fun part about conducting this research with young children is that there's just so much that we don't know at this point. And it seems like the more data we collect, the more new questions just keep popping up. So obviously there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in order to strengthen our understanding of the maturing circadian system and how photosensitivity changes across development. And also so that we can provide recommendations for parents and other stakeholders on best practices in lighting to support healthy sleep throughout childhood. Looking ahead, we are currently collecting data to further examine preschoolers' circadian sensitivity to light. First, we are conducting a within subject study to examine the sensitivity of the circadian clock to differences in light spectrum. Using the same 10 day protocol that I described earlier, we are comparing melatonin suppression and phase delay in response to an evening light exposure to cool versus warm LED light. The 5,000 Kelvin light source that we're using as a cool light is very similar to that used in our earlier study on light intensity, but we wanna know if compared to that, exposure to a warmer white light containing less blue light and therefore less stimulating to the IPRGC results in less melatonin suppression and phase delay in these young children. And these findings will be especially informative to recommendations on the evening light environment and the use of light adjusting software on media devices for children, such as Flux or Apple Night Shift. We are also employing a modified version of that protocol to examine the sensitivity of the phase advance response to morning light of various intensities. And finally, we're also collecting pupillary data in both of those studies to examine whether baseline pupil size and the PLR are associated with the circadian response to light in young children. So here you see a kiddo wearing those eye tracking glasses during a light exposure out in the field. And through these data, we hope to continue to add to our understanding of the developmental trajectory of the human non-visual system. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you to everyone involved in this research and our funding sources. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and also please feel free to email me at the address on the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much. much.